I don't know when you became a Christian, but I became a Christian when I was 17, 16, 17. And one of the things I thought initially when I became a Christian is that God's done this great thing for me and now I need to live differently and try harder and be a better person and be more like him. And what I found out over the following years is that I was, however much I tried, I, I couldn't become like him uh, just by trying. And one of the things that God began to show me is that that's part of the purpose and the, and the role of the Holy Spirit is to transform us. And so you probably had a similar experience as well, I imagine, where uh, you notice after a little while of following Jesus that you've begun to change. And it's an amazing thing. Oh, and actually, can we just start the clock? Otherwise, this could be a very long one. It's an amazing thing um, uh, to, to understand that God loves us just as we are, like the best of us and the worst of us. He sees the worst of us and he stays. But also that that love, when it's poured into us, changes who we are. And so in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says that God pours the love of God into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And it's impossible to encounter God and encounter the Holy Spirit and not be changed. It's like trying to press your face against the sun and not get burned. Like if you go near the Lord, he will change you. And we'll each have our own version of, of what that's looked like in our lives. And so for me, what it's been is uh, one of the big things has been just to do with my emotions. So when I became a Christian, for various reasons, I was emotionally very shut down. Uh, I've been hurt in a few different ways and I decided, I made a vow one day, no one will ever hurt me again. And uh, put on all this protection, armour as it were, to make sure that no one could, could ever do that. And uh, without realising, what I did is I really shut down all emotion because you can't just shut down like pain. You have to shut down joy at the same time. And so by the time I became a Christian, I was quite cold as a, as a person, uh, a little bit robotic. And people used to talk about me like I was this aloof and distant person who didn't care. And I did care, but I just didn't know how to show it. And I found that I couldn't change that when I realised that there was a problem. What happened is God softened me. And it's a little like if you, uh, you know, when you come from a cold day outside and you come inside and your hands are all numb, uh, what you do to warm them up is you breathe on them. And it was as if when I came to know Jesus, he breathed his life into me and just gradually uh, softened me up. And uh, I, I discovered that being a Christian wasn't just going from being bad to being good, but going from being dead to being alive again. And uh, there have been other things. I have a massive, and it's a journey, I'm still on a fear of failure. Like this crippling thing that, that, uh, that um, hobbles me in some ways. Because I think if I'm not successful, no one's going to love me. And God's working on that one. Uh, I still have battles with it regularly. But gradually, over time, I've come to uh, see in, it, in, in my soul, not just in my head, that, that he, he really is my dad. And he really does love me. And I don't know what your story of change has been, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit that has brought that about. And what I wanted to talk about this morning is uh, to be really practical. And I suppose to ask the question, all right, if the Holy Spirit changes and transforms me, how can I open myself up more to that transforming power? And I want to get uh, really specific. So one of the ways that the Spirit works in the church is through the gifts of the Spirit and our partnering with Him in that. And I want to talk about one gift. So there's loads of different ones, prophecy and praying for healing. But this morning, I want to talk about the gift of praying and speaking in tongues. And uh, if this is something that you already do, hang in there, because I hope there'll be some stuff here that might be a refresher for you. Um, but either way, this is where we're going to go. So first question. What is uh, the gift of speaking in tongues? And in a nutshell, what it is, is it's a prayer language that God gives us supernaturally. And sometimes it's an actual foreign language that exists, so it could be like Chinese or something. But other times it's an angelic language or a heavenly language that no one on earth speaks. The key point about it is that it's a language that you don't learn. You don't do a GCSE or a degree in this language. It simply gets given to you supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. And I understand even as I say that, that sounds a little bit weird, doesn't it? And so one of the first questions I would have if I was listening to that is, wow, okay, that's strange. Where's that in the Bible? And um, to answer that, you don't need to look any further than our family history, the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out and we read in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that happens, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, it happens elsewhere as well. So Acts chapter 10, 
dear old Pete is giving a talk to a whole load of uh, Gentiles and halfway through his talk, the Holy Spirit just interrupts him and he breaks out in power. And what happens then is the Spirit comes and then also they begin to pray in tongues in that particular moment. The same thing happens in Acts chapter 19. Paul meets a bunch of believers in Ephesus and they've heard about Jesus but they haven't heard about the Holy Spirit yet and so he tells them and the Holy Spirit again arrives on the scene, fills them up that we're told in Acts 19 that they begin to prophesy and also to speak in tongues. And so right off the bat what that shows us is that it's quite a normal thing in the book of Acts, that when the Holy Spirit arrives, people begin to pray in a prayer language. He distributes these prayer languages. Now, it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's quite a natural thing. And it would be a little like if some music were to come on. Can we have some music on, please? Wow, that was not the track I was expecting, genuinely. But if some music comes, switch that off now. I'm going to switch the sound guy afterwards. I said, give me a track we can dance to, and that's what he chose. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> so if some music comes on, yeah, you don't have to dance to it, but it's not an unusual thing that when music happens, people start dancing. Again, it's a similar connection. You don't have to pray in tongues. All of us, you know, as Tim said so well last night, we, those of us who know the Lord have the Spirit of God living inside of us, whether we pray in tongues or we don't pray in tongues. But what we see in the book of Acts is it's quite a normal and a natural thing that when the Spirit arrives, people begin to pray in prayer languages. And uh, one of the churches that this happened in, in the early church, was a church in a place called Corinth. And Paul wrote a couple of letters to the Corinthians, one and two Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 12 and chapter 14, he writes about the spiritual gifts. And when I first read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and I was looking at what Paul says about the gift of praying in tongues, I thought, wow, he seems to be pretty negative on tongues. I don't know if you've ever read that chapter. Uh, but there's some stuff in there that makes, him th- makes you think, oh, he's not that into tongues. And the first point is uh, he says that it's not the most important gift of all the spiritual gifts, and it isn't. Uh, he says the most important gifts are the ones like prophecy that build up the church, that build up other people. And so he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies or builds up the church. So he says it's not the most important of the gifts. And the second thing that makes me think, oh, Paul's not there into the gift of tongues, is he tells them off for the way that they were using it. And uh, what was happening in the church in Corinth is that they were using the gift of tongues in a way that it wasn't designed to be used. So they were getting up and giving sermons in the gift of tongues. And can you imagine that? Like if you took your mate to church and taking someone to church for the first time is a weird experience for them anyway. But then the person who's speaking gets up and gives a talk in a language that nobody understands and that they don't even understand. And then it happens again and again and again because that's what would happen in the church in Corinth. A number of people would get up and give talks and they would all be speaking in languages that nobody understood. And so Paul is saying, don't do that. He's correcting them. He's saying, you're using it in the wrong way. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18 and 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in church, by which he means when he's preaching, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. What's the point of saying 10,000 words that nobody understands? Pick five that they do understand when you're speaking, is what he's saying. But what's really going on there is uh, it's a little like if I was just walking around the campsite early this morning and I saw some people brushing their teeth and you were brushing your teeth with like hair wax or something like that. Now what I might do if you were brushing your teeth with hair wax is go up to you and say, hey, Don't brush your teeth with hair wax. That doesn't mean I'm anti-hair wax. In fact, I thank God that I use hair wax more than any of you. What it means (laughs) is that you need to use it for what it's designed for. And that's that's the point that Paul is making to the Corinthians. And though the passage on the surface might seem like he's not that into tongues, actually there's all these clues that reveal that for him, though he understood it wasn't the most important of the gifts, to him it was a precious one. And one of those clues is where he says, we just read it, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than any of you. I, 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 the weight of that only hit me a little while ago, that Paul the Apostle, like, the, you know, he's the big daddy, like, you know, he, God uses him to write a whole load of the New Testament, to plant churches everywhere. Paul the great Apostle prayed in tongues loads, more than anybody else. 
And a question that that causes me to ask is, why? What does he get about this gift that nobody else got in the same way? And one of the things that he understood about it, one of the things that he got is that it edifies you. It builds you up to pray in tongues. So you may have picked up that there is a tiny bit of rivalry between myself and Mike. And uh, the friction that's evident on the stage is even more evident off the stage. Uh, we're a little competitive. And one of the things that we love to compete in is we, uh, we go to the gym. And Mike, um, Mike is stronger than he looks. Uh, he's 120 stone of pure muscle. And we, we have competed at the gym for, for years and years and years on all these different weights machines. And, and one of the, we went through a phase like a few years ago where he just was beating me at everything and I couldn't understand. I just couldn't get my head around it. How is he managing to top me up? We do, we're doing all the same training sessions and uh, he was still winning. And he confessed to me after about three or four months that he had been secretly drinking protein supplements and hiding them in his kitchen every time I went into his house and as if he needed help bulking up. But he... <laughs> That's what he was doing. And what protein does when you exercise. <laughs> when you exercise, what protein does is it, it builds the muscles. So it's there to kind of help muscles grow. And it, we're, as followers of Jesus, okay, we're all going to grow spiritual muscle. We're all going to do that. As we follow him, you build muscle. As you, as you read the word, you build muscle. As you obey him, you build muscle. But what praying in tongues can be is it can be helpful in that process. It can, it can supplement. I want to comp compare praying in tongues to a protein supplement, but, but I've already done it. But it's like it's, it's, it, it, it helps you grow and it helps build you up. It's like exercising in a way, or it's like taking something that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that will grow a muscle. It's a tool that's helpful in that. And Paul did it a lot because he understood that. And so here's three different ways. If you take your notes, um, there's three different ways I want to suggest that praying in the gift of tongues or speaking in tongues can build us up. Way number one is this. It gives our soul a voice. And have you, ever, have you ever had a time where like, you've got some stuff in here that you just want to say, but you don't know how to say it? Um, you know, it's just like a whole, maybe a whole mess of emotions or a cocktail of emotions. You don't know how to, how to get it out. And it's a little like, if you imagine that we are like this bottle of Coke. Yeah, and sometimes things happen in life and they just shake, they shake us up, like the Coke gets shaken up. When the Coke is shaken up, all of this wants to come out the bottle now. It's dying to get out the bottle, but the cap is stopping it from getting out of the bottle. If I were to come along with like a, a pen or something like that and just punch a hole in the side of this bottle, then all that would come out of the side. And a little bit, sometimes we're like that, where we've got all this stuff churning around inside of us. And the mind, although it's incredibly important, isn't always that helpful for articulating really deep emotions. Sometimes we don't even know how to say what we're feeling inside. Sometimes, you, know, you can't even describe the smell of coffee, can you? So sometimes to describe how you're feeling really deep in your soul is incredibly difficult. And what the gift of tongues is, is it's as if it punctures us in the soul directly, bypassing the mind, allowing all this stuff that's in there to come pouring out to God. And the way that Paul writes about it is he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, again in verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. And so what I love about that is it says really clearly, we're to praise God with our minds. You know, our, our, our minds are important. Paul had a big brain and he used it well. We're told to love God with our minds. It's great and glorious to sing the mighty truths of our faith as we have been doing. But also, it says that there's a place for praying in the Spirit where we're not using our minds, but something's just being poured out directly from our spirit to God's spirit. And uh, that's one of the ways and that's one of the places where the gift of tongues uh, comes into play. And as someone who personally has operated from my head for most of my life, that's where I function from, um, I have found the gift of tongues to have immense value. So one of those times is when it comes to uh, praise and it comes to worship. 
I don't know if you've ever had an experience where you just want to say something to somebody like thank you or I love you and you've run out of the ways to say it. You know, you ever find that? You just can't articulate what it is that you're to say. So for me, sometimes it's with Beth and with the kids. I don't know how to put it. Uh, sometimes for Mike, if someone gives him some free food, he's lost for words. And it's that thing, how do you get that out? That's where the gift of tongues can come in handy. It's where, you know, like when... for. for for God, sometimes when he shows us that his unconditional forgiveness and you finally get a revelation of the fact that everything you've ever said, thought and done is completely, you know, wiped clean. How do you say thank you for that? Sometimes it's when you see the unending grace of God, that it goes ahead of you and that all the times you're going to stumble in the future, he's going to be there to pick you back up again and you have a revelation of that. Maybe it's what Ali was talking about yesterday morning when you finally get... You know, oh my word, you're my dad. But there are always going to be times when we don't know what to say. And it's no coincidence that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they began to speak in tongues, they declared the praises of God. It's not just a prayer language, it's a language of worship. So sometimes it can be in a moment like that, it plays a role. Other times it can be uh, in times of despair. And um, one of the darkest times in my, in my life in the last couple of years... You just saw my little boy, Jos, Josiah, who's now two, uh, up on stage a minute ago. When he was, when he was born, uh, obviously it was amazing. And we, Beth and I were thrilled in all, all the birth and everything went really well. And we took him home the next day. And there's nothing quite like that. You know, you arrive home with your, with your child for the first time. And uh, it was just, our house was just so full of joy and of life. And everyone's coming around to see him. And we just so, uh, we were celebrating. And then uh, the next day, the district nurse came over to have a look at Josiah, just to check he was all good. And she said, he doesn't look, there's something not quite right. So we ended up having to take him into A&E uh, that night. And uh, they were really concerned about him. And I remember holding him as they, as they put a feeding tube up his nose. And he was scre- you know, screaming his head off. And then they checked Beth in and they checked him back in um, because they just wanted to make sure everything was all right. And I remember driving home. Uh, that night and arriving uh, back to my house which that morning had just been full of joy and it was just empty and dark and it was me and I was pretty low and um, I remember waking up the next morning just expecting Josiah to have rallied because they'd been in hospital pumping him full of food and stuff like that expecting him to have got better overnight and calling Beth at like 6.30 in the morning and and finding out that they'd they'd actually got more concerned about him uh, overnight, and they moved him from kind of like medium care to like super special care, and uh, that she was just so exhausted because she'd just given birth, so she couldn't be with him. So that drive in, I, I remember it was a Tuesday morning driving to Watford General Hospital. I mean, I felt absolutely sick, and uh, I remember going up to the uh, the special baby unit uh, and seeing him as I walked into this room. He's just by himself in this incubator, my tiny little boy with all these tubes coming out of him. And uh, it didn't get better very quickly. Uh, It didn't feel very quick anyway. It took a while. It was up and down. And during that time, I just didn't know what to do. I I sat in silence before God. I read some Psalms um, before him, and I prayed in tongues. I just had all this stuff, and I just didn't know what to say. And that's where, for me, praying in tongues became like this uh, direct tapping into the soul and pouring out what I knew what I meant, but I didn't know how to say it. Uh, tongues was, was helpful for me in that moment. And it's not just at times of high praise or utter despair. It's the normal everyday prayers where it can, where it can be a really useful tool. So I don't know if you've prayed for somebody, maybe you've prayed some, for somebody for like 10 years and stuff like that, and you're like, I don't know what else to say now. You know, I've run out of stuff. I just want this person to be a Christian, but I've said that like a thousand times to you. Well, sometimes now what I do, if I don't know what to say, is I just... I'll name a person before God and then I'll just pray in tongues for them. And Paul himself says that he had moments, which is a bit of a relief, where he didn't know what to pray either. So he says uh, in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We, don't, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now in that, Paul is talking about more than just praying in tongues. But praying in tongues is a big part of what it is to pray uh, in the Holy Spirit. 
And so when you don't know what to pray, pray in tongues because the Spirit always knows and the Father listens to the Spirit. It gives a voice, a, a, a voice to our soul. The second way um, that praying in tongues can build us up is it draws us near to God. And um, praying in tongues can seem like an activity, like, like a job that you put on the to-do list, I'm going to pray in tongues today. But actually, it's not like that. It's, it, that will be like thinking about a conversation, like I'm going to have a conversation with somebody today. It's, it's not that. It's like a relational thing. So, you know, if you've, if you've seen a friend here that you haven't seen for maybe a few months, you want to go and have a coffee with them or whatever and catch up over a piece of cheesecake, and you're looking forward to that. And what that is, is that's a relational thing. That's a sharing hearts with somebody. And that's what it is to pray in tongues. It's not, I'm going to do this today. It's, I'm sharing my heart with God. No, we're, we're having a moment of intimacy and a moment of relationship. And uh, again, Pilav and I, occasionally we do crazy things. And we, um, Mike and I drove a few years ago now from Watford to uh, Shepton Mallet, which is like a two and a half hour drive. And we decided at the start of this drive that we were going to pray in tongues for the whole thing. So... <laughs> We started praying in tongues just as we were pulling out of the driveway uh, in Watford, and we kept praying in tongues all the way down the M25. And two and a half hours later, we arrived at Shepton Mallet. And by the time we arrived at Shepton Mallet, we were ready to take off. I mean, we were going to fly. Like, we felt like we were going to explode. And I don't know where it happened on the M25 exactly, but at some point, it was like the glory of God just filled the car. And uh, at, at points, we were laughing our heads off, uh, at points, there was just, we were just adoring him. But it was, like, it was just like the presence of Jesus was right there with us. And I don't know if you find this, but sometimes my experience has been when you're at a place like this, it's easy to feel close to God. You know, there's loads of other people. We're all going for it. We're outside of our normal everyday lives. But then you go home again. And one of the questions I have is when I'm at home, how do I be in his presence? How do I be near to him? Praying in tongues can be one way. It's not the only way by any means, but it can be a helpful way of drawing near. And so it says in Jude, verse 20, and praying in the Spirit, keep yourself in God's love. It's a bit like the Spirit is like a, a wave poured out on a beach. You know, the wave goes out on the beach and what it does is it draws the pebbles back into the ocean. So the Spirit is poured out by the Father and he draws us back into relationship with God. He keeps us in the love of God. So it's one way of staying near to him. And the third and the final way that the Holy Spirit uh, praying in tongues builds us up is it can lead to breakthrough in our lives and in the lives of other people. And so in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, Paul says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And the context of that verse is spiritual warfare. And what Paul is saying is that we want to, it's kind of like we want God's kingdom to come and we want his will to be done and we want his, his power to break through in our towns, in our families, in our own lives, in the lives of the people that we love. And praying in tongues does build us up, but also it seems to have an indirect effect on those around us. And at this point, I just want to invite Mike uh, to come up and uh, he's just cuddling Judah, so he's going to have to put him down and uh, just share about something that happened to him a little while ago. You weren't listening to anything I was saying. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, 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 some years ago... Um, <laughs> some, <laughs> sorry. I was, I was, we were going chuffy, chuff, chuff. Um, um, so I'm still in that mode. Uh, some, um, s- some years ago, um, at a Soul Survivor Festival... Uh, it was at the time at the big top in Somerset. Um, we, we had an evening where, um, at the end, we invited people forward if they wanted to pray in tongues, like we're probably going to do in a few minutes. And um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of young people came forward. And um, uh, there was, um, at the, uh, a Romanian youth group came, and they were connected with a church in Yorkshire, I remember, and, uh, you know, they enjoyed the week. But the youth leader uh, didn't believe uh, that the gift of tongues was for today. And uh, uh, when we got all the young people together, um, I said, you know what? The, uh, we, we step out in faith. Uh, we won't know, you know, we, 
you know, we, we, and I'm just, we're just going to start to pray in tongues. I'm going to encourage you to just begin to open your mouth. It says in Acts chapter 2, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And the Spirit doesn't take over you. You know, you have to do the speaking, but the Spirit will give you the utterance. And then I said, and what we're going to do is, uh, well, those of us that pray in tongues, we're going to begin to worship the Lord in our prayer language. And um, uh, when you're ready, you join in. You just join in. No one's going to be listening and all of that. Well, anyway, um, I started praying in tongues over the microphone. And uh, um, I just suddenly thought, gosh, my tongue sounds a bit different to normal. It sounds a little bit more, is it more posh? Am I putting it on a little bit? I actually thought this. Am I putting it on a little bit subconsciously because people are listening to make my tongue sound a little more posh? And, and, and it was like, well, I'll just go for it anyway. And, and I did. And what happened was, uh, when we started praying in tongues, this Romanian youth leader started to walk out in anger. And he was halfway out the tent uh, when he just stopped in his tracks uh, because apparently what he says was, um, I was, I was praying in, uh, in uh, uh, um, kind of um, medieval Romanian, and I was actually reciting a well-known Romanian prayer, uh, poem, poem, and the poem was called A Prayer for Protection. And this is the crazy thing. That poem was tattooed on his father's back. And uh, um, that guy started believing in the gift of tongues um, <laughs> after that. And, you know, I thought it was gobbledygook. And, uh, <laughs> needless to say, Mark was very pleased with himself when he found out he'd been speaking Romanian. <laughs> but, um, do you see, so there's, there's sometimes we pray in tongues, and without even knowing it, it begins to have an impact on the world around us. And so, uh, Jackie Pullinger famously uh, went off to Hong Kong uh, years and years ago now, when she was in her early 20s. And she found herself working with drug addicts and, and uh, triad gang members and stuff like that. And in the early years, it was incredibly difficult for her to make any headway. And she writes about uh, one of the times when she began to see real breakthrough. And it came when she decided that she was going to pray in tongues. So she just literally, she did it by, by her watch. So she said, I'm just going to commit to praying in tongues for 15 minutes every day. And after doing that for six weeks, uh, she says this. After about six weeks of this, I began to lead people to Jesus without trying. Gangsters fell to their knees, sobbing in the streets. Women were healed. Heroin addicts were miraculously set free. And I knew it was nothing to do with me. And she would say it was everything to do with beginning to pray more uh, in the spirit, and particularly for her, with the gift of tongues. And so what does it do? Uh, the gift of tongues builds us up, and it builds us up because it gives our soul a voice, it draws us near to God, and through it, it can lead to breakthrough. Uh, finally, I suppose I just want to ask the question, if that is uh, what the gift of tongues does, how do we get that? You know, how do we receive it? And Jesus says these words in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So how do we receive the gift of tongues? Three things. Firstly, ask. We just ask for it. And for years, I made asking God for stuff more complicated than it needs to be. It's really very simple. You just say, I would like to have the gift of tongues, please. That's basically it. It's asking. Now, just to make it simple doesn't mean that we take that lightly. So we want to thirst after the gift. And what Jesus seems to be implying when he says, ask and seek and knock, and then he repeats that thing again, ask and seek and knock, is that there's a persistence involved sometimes in seeking something from God, even though it's not a complicated thing. And so sometimes we, we're tempted to treat receiving things from God like we're trying to stream something live, you know? And if, if it takes more than 30 seconds to buffer the video, you just quit. And we think, oh, I'm not getting it from the Lord. I'm just going to call it a day. That's 
not what it is. It's thirsting. So think of it more like, imagine that you've just run a really, uh, like a marathon or something on a really hot day, 26 miles in the heat. By the time you get to the end of it, you are, you are gagging for a drink. Your body's been pouring out sweat. Your mouth is parched. Your tongue is thick in your mouth. And you go up to somebody. You don't need to say it, make it complicated. You just say, I would like a drink of water, please. But then you're waiting for that water. And that's like, a, it's a simple asking, but it's a really, you really want this asking. I really would love to receive this gift of water from you. And if they take a while, you don't just call it a day and quit because you need it. So you ask. That's the first step. Ask for the gift of tongues. The second step is believe that he wants to give it to you. And this is one of the steps that, this is the thing I find really hard, believing that he wants to give it to me. I have faith that he wants to give it to every other person in this room. But me, not always sure. You know, the guy next to me, yeah. The person in front of me, sure. But me, I'm not sure about that. And this is, it really helps to believe that he wants to give this gift to you to receive it. And it's a bit some of the stuff that Ali was saying yesterday about understanding that he is, as Jesus says, a good father who wants to give us good things. And one picture that really helped me was when a friend of mine told me about his, um, uh, his niece and how uh, she was seven years old. And he says her favorite game is hide and seek. So he was playing hide and seek with her a little while ago. And he said, um, when he's playing games with tiny little kids, he's realized that it's always best to clarify the rules beforehand. Because if you do it during the game, they tend to go against you. And so he asked little Alice, you know, what are the rules of hide and seek? And so she said to him, uh, okay, uncle, the rules are I'm going to go and hide behind the kitchen door and you close your eyes and count to 10 and then you come and find me. So he said, okay, then let's do that. So, you know, counts to 10 and then when he's finished counting to 10, he just starts looking for her. Alice, where are you? Is Alice underneath the kitchen table? Squeals of laughter from behind the kitchen door. Where's Alice? Is Alice hiding in the kitchen cupboard? Squeals of laughter from behind the kitchen door. Where's Alice? Is Alice behind the kitchen door? absolute hysterics from behind the kitchen door and he finds her and then she says okay uncle okay we're going to play again the rules are this time okay I'm going to go and hide under mummy and daddy's bed and you stay here and count to 10 and then come and find me and what I love about that is the fun thing for Alice is the being found in that sense uh, God is similar you know he says okay we're going to we're going to this is how we're going to do it I want you to ask Uh, I want you to knock and I want you to seek. And then here's the rules. You will find me. That's the best bit for me. You are definitely, definitely going to receive. I will for sure open the door. You will find me. So believe that you will. Because you will. And the final step is you've got to step out. Uh, you have to have a go at doing it for it to happen. And this for me was one of the huge things I've been learning about spiritual gifts. I'm still learning it over the last couple of years. But one of the keys to understanding growing in the spiritual gifts is to get that spiritual gifts, most of the time, do not feel very spiritual. Most of the time, they feel very, very normal. And I just want to finish by saying um, my story about how I received the gift of tongues. And then I'm going to get Mike to come and share his because his was uh, a big step for me in receiving my gift. I wish I had an impressive story to tell you, but I don't. Uh, This is how it happened. I remember hearing Mike preach about the gift of tongues and thinking, I want to have that gift. So I came forward in a couple of meetings and asked God to, to give the gift to me. And uh, nothing happened, mainly because I just was too scared to step out and try. Uh, fear of failure. Don't like taking risks. So I wouldn't do it. And then there was this one time when we were in Australia. And again, I came forward in the meeting and it seemed like everybody else began to pray in tongues apart from me. And uh, I remember leaving that meeting, just feeling really upset and down and frustrated and going and finding a tree. And I sat underneath this tree and um, I, just, I just decided there was no one there to watch me fail. It was just me and Jesus. So I decided that I would just have a go. And I said, Lord, I really want this gift. Please give it to me. And then I decided, now's the time. Just say something. And the way it works is not how I thought. I thought he'd take over my mouth and it would be like, you know, this beautiful language would come out. It turns out it's not like that at all. It doesn't feel spiritual at all, really. Um, and it's like this partnership. And as Mike just said, uh, You speak and the Spirit enables you. And there's this kind of like teamwork thing going on. So I just choked out this this unimpressive, seriously unspiritual sounding noise. 
That's all I can say. It didn't sound like a word. It sounded more like a noise. And, um, and Mike had said in his talk that uh, when he was receiving this gift, he decided, if this is going to be gobbledygook, may it be gobbledygook for you, Lord. And so I thought, that's a helpful principle. I'll take that. So I said to myself, if this is going to be a coughing, choking sound, Lord, may it be for your glory. And I continued to do it. And I did it for a little while there under that tree. And uh, it didn't get any more uh, spiritual sounding uh, than it was when it started initially. And then what happened is it grew. A bit like a kid learning their ABCs. You know, they start out not really being able to say it. And then just gradually language comes. And I know that was when it began, the gift of tongues, as really normal as that sounds. And one of the reasons I know is because I've been praying in it ever since. And what I've found as I've prayed in it is that it's given my soul a voice. And it's drawn me into his love. And I've seen breakthroughs in my life and others that I don't think I would have seen otherwise. Now Mike is going to come and share his story. And um, for, for me, it was, um, uh, I'd become a Christian, uh, I was um, uh, 16 years old by this stage, and I heard about the gift of tongues, and uh, I, I had exactly the same as Andy, you know, uh, God's not going to give it to me, and this will be the proof uh, that I'm not a Christian, that he hasn't accepted me. And uh, I, I, when I heard about that, um, I read this book, and, this, and the author of the book said, um, you know, you just gotta, you just got to ask Jesus and begin. And I didn't want anyone to pray for me, because if it didn't happen, then they'd know that God hadn't accepted me. So I went up to my bedroom one evening, and I closed the curtains, because I've always believed it's more holy in the dark. And, uh, and uh, the book said, in the book, the guy said, if you want to receive the gift of tongues, first of all, confess your sins so that everything's clear, then praise God in English, and then after a while, you know, just, just begin, and the, and the, and the Lord will, will, will give you the words. So um, I confess my sins, uh, I praise God in English, and then I went, and nothing happened. And uh, I thought, I haven't, I haven't confessed my sins with enough sorrow. So I confessed them again, this time feeling really bad about them. I praised God in English and then, and nothing. And then I remembered that in the book, the guy said that often people begin to speak in tongues when they're more relaxed. Uh, so I went to the bathroom, I put the bath water on, I put it really hot, I got in the bath, I lay in the bath, I confessed my sins. This time I confessed sins that I might commit in the future. Um, I confess sins that I'd read about um, in some newspapers. And, uh, and then I praise God in English, and then, and nothing. And then I thought, I know what's wrong. So I got the Radox out, and I put it in for extra <laughs> relaxation. I confess my sins, I praise God in English, I, and still nothing. And by this stage, I was just desperate. I was desperate, so I plucked up the courage uh, to go to this couple who headed up my, my little home group, and I said, I said um, I, I've been asking the Lord to speak in tongues, and, and maybe he doesn't accept me, but nothing's happened. And could you pray with me? And they said, of course we will. And they said, come into the, uh, this other room. We sat in the room, and then they said to me, what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to confess our sins, and I thought, being the head, bought the T-shirt, and, uh, and, and then we're going to all praise God in English. And I thought, I could teach you a thing or two about praising God in English. And then they said, and then the two of us are going to begin to pray in our prayer language. And after a while, one of us will touch your lips and then by faith begin. At this stage, I just panicked. I thought, oh no. And then they, we, we confessed our sins. We praised God in English. And then they began to pray in their prayer languages. And their languages sounded beautiful. They sounded wonderful. And if there was one thing I just knew straight away was, I'm never going to be able to do that. You know, and, and I was dreading it. I was thinking, what am I going to do when they touch my lips? You know, and, 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 and I was like, um, and, and then after, it seemed ages, but it wasn't long. And then one of them touched my lips. And it's like I had a choice. And, and rather than say nothing, 
I just, under my breath, I just went, shalabala bala. <laughs> and then I was waiting for one of them to point at me and say, false tongue speaker, stone him. <laughs> but you know, they didn't. I heard them saying, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Give him more. And I thought, they like this, <laughs> you know? So they carried on and I thought, okay, I'll give it another go. So I, I went, shalabala bila bala. And, <laughs> And they, and they were like really excited. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give him more. And, and all my life, I've been nothing if not a showman. So, so, this, time, so this time I went, shalabala, bilabala, bulabala. Well, they went hysterical at that. And for the, next, for the next, I don't know, 10 minutes, they spoke in their beautiful Latin and ancient something, whatever it was. And I shalabala, bilabala, bulabala all over the place. And that's all I did. Shalabala, bila, bala, bula, bala. And then at the end we finished and I looked at them and I said, was that it? <laughs> and the husband looked at me and he said, yes. And I want you to do that every day for the rest of your life. And I remember thinking, I am not doing that every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> Shalabala, bila, bala, bula, bala. Anyway, I left thinking, what is that? And I remember thinking, thinking, I think, I think everyone else gets the gift of tongues. And like Andy said, and I've got the gift of gobbledygook. And I was halfway home, walking home. And I remember thinking, you know what? If I end up with just the gift of gobbledygook, may it be gobbledygook to you, Lord Jesus. May it be for you. So I just made sure no one was nearby. And as I was walking, I just, shala bala bila bala bula, bula bula bala bila, shala, shala bala, shala bula bula, shala. I did every combination. And I... <laughs> And I shall have all the way home. But do you know what? I promise you, there came a point, and it was just like this magical little line. Um, there came a point where I stopped thinking about my shalabalas, and I started focusing on him, and, 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 and actually being aware of him. And, and just suddenly, everything changed. And I just sensed his presence in a way I hadn't before. Now, often when I'm praying tongues, I, you don't sense his presence every time like that. But I just knew, oh my word, you're here. And I started not to mind what it was. But you know what? Over the weeks and over the months, it was like the shalabala was, was at the beginning, it was baby talk. And then as we went, I went on, it just, it just developed. And it was, it was, I was focused on Jesus. And it wasn't that the language developed. The point about the gift of tongues is not the tongues. The point is the prayer. You know, the point is the prayer. It's a way of praying. Any way of praying is good. Any way of praying gets you close to Jesus. And, and so over the years since, I have found it so, so, I can't tell you, so helpful in my personal walk with the Lord. You know, I, you, you, your, your mind is unfruitful. And there are times of praying with your mind, but there are times, you know, of praying with the Spirit. We do not know how to pray as we ought, says Paul uh, in Romans 8. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You know, this is one of the ways the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And, and what it is, in Romans 8, Paul talks about sighs and groans too deep for words. There is that as well, but there is also this, which is, which is a, a cry from the heart that the Spirit inspires. And, and since there have been times when I know that, that so often the gift of tongues is the doorway to the other gifts, the number of times, because it sensitizes you. Prayer makes you sensitive to, to other gifts. The number of times I've been wondering, Lord, what do you want me to do? What's going on? And I've prayed in my prayer language, and then I just know while I've been praying, God has spoken to me.